So I'm going to be presenting Elixir for Rubyists. Assuming uh, an audience that have been coding in Ruby for long, I'm going to present what we've been learning of Phoenix and Elixir. Uh, I will start top down. So I will start speaking of the web framework Phoenix as a Rails for Elixir. But then I'm going to talk about how Phoenix is different than Rails. And the same with uh, Elixir. First, how Elixir is similar to Ruby. But then how Elixir is different. First, because it sits on top of Erlang, so we'll need to talk about Erlang. And then because Elixir is Elixir, and it's something other than Erlang. Um, so let's start. Let's see. Phoenix and, and Rails feel surprisingly similar when you start. It's weird. It's like suspicious. Both are MVC. <laughs> both give you a default directory structure. Both give you testing. Both give you a database, PostgreSQL by default in, in Phoenix. Both focus on security and productivity, front end, back end. So they look very similar. They have very similar conventions. Uh, code looks very similar when you look at it. The only different thing here, meaningful, is that it's explicit, the, the state is explicit. So for example, the show action receives a connection, which is comparable to the rack env, where you get information about the request and can modify the response. There are differences that render is explicit. And there are differences that everything in Elixir is a function. So testing the second version of this controller is, is easy. It, it resembles uh, Angular, in which you can pass in any object that has those methods defined, assign, and user in this case, and it will work. And you don't need to initialize or stub out our objects to satisfy the, <laughs> the, the architecture. What else? Uh, here there's uh, implicit context in Rails. You have uh, params, you have uh, uh, the request object, you have session, you have instance variables, that you, and you get none of that in, in Elixir. Everything is passed as arguments to your functions. Phoenix as Phoenix is a bit different, so it also follows a convention over configuration thing, which is a great thing, but not as much. I'm sorry that I don't, ha don't have slides. I hope I'm not distracting you with all this text. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit more explicit than Rails, but it's not so explicit as other languages. So it, it's in a sweet spot, some would argue, which I find very, very good. Uh, and it has also live reload, which is something I was missing from Ember. And whenever you save a SAS file, or a controller, or a model, or a Neo6 uh, JavaScript file, it will blazingly fast just re reload the browser. And I don't know how it does this. But if you're in the middle of a post request in a form, and you edit something, it will retry that post request, which is weird. And it reloads being smart about that state that you have in your browser. If you have a file in, a, in an input field, in a file field, it also remembers that. I don't know how it does that. That's mysterious to me yet. Now, Elixir. Elixir is um, like Ruby for the Erlang ma machine, you might, you might think. And you might be right in many ways. The syntax is very similar. Both languages are high level, fun, productive, readable. The tools, there's the direct mapping of, of, of tooling. IRB to IEX, Rake and Bundler are built into Mix in Elixir. Pry is built in, polymorphism you get through protocols, lazy enumerables you get through streams, metaprogramming you get through macros, that's fun. And you get a fra web framework which is also very, very uh, reliable. The macros documentation is fun because it allows you to extend the language and define your own constructs in Elixir, but the very first paragraph says, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great, like you start reading the documentation and it's like you can do it, but you probably shouldn't. And come back when you're sure that you want to do this. So it, it promotes, the community promotes this idea of being explicit and clear, which is something I, I enjoy. Well, and the community also resembles Ruby. Very, uh, very, uh, a lot of hype, a lot of work, a lot of con collaboration happening, people publishing the software that they are writing. Okay, we moved on to what is different about Elixir? And this is where it gets very interesting to me. So uh, as of now, you could be doing Elixir and, and Phoenix as you're doing Ruby and Rails because your client asked you to. And that's fine, and that works well. But what do you get because you're using Elixir? The first thing that you get is Erlang, virtual machine. I never heard of this, this is crazy. I'm surprised that I never heard of it at college or anything. It's three decades old, the Erlang virtual machine. It started at Ericsson. It's open source for like 18 years now. And it's still maintained by, by Ericsson. So, so it's a very healthy open source project. Uh, recently, like uh, two years ago, actually, WhatsApp published this blog post, a famous one that said, oh, we got two million TCP connections open in a sing single box. And I wanted to understand what does Erlang do to make this possible? Why is it different? And why other platforms and architectures don't do that as well? What do we lose? 
So the details are here, which I found interesting. The too long didn't read version is that uh, you don't get mutability, so you don't get state, and uh, there's no shared memory, almost ever. And well, it implements its own version of processes and of threads inside of the virtual machine, which are not mapping one-to-one -to, -one to the operating system ones, which are heavier, and they need to tra track the shared memory and the context of the processor when preemptively something comes into your processor to execute because there was an interruption or whatever. You don't get any of that in Erlang. And that's why it can be lighter and faster. I put some details there. Probably that would be a blog post. Uh, another interesting thing of Erlang is fault tolerance. Fault tolerance for Erlang means that it's OK to maybe drop one user's phone call, but it's not OK to drop everyone's phone call because, as, as Joseph Alim put it, uh, when you are in a telecommunication company working, you can't say to everyone from 6 to 6.30 a.m., there's no phone-like system. We're going to upgrade the system. You just don't do that. You have to do hot call swapping, and you have to be always on. So uh, Erlang doesn't have any single point of failure. Software automatically oh. runs concurrently, even if you don't think about it, because it's guaranteed by the language itself. Uh, and this allows for some self-healing uh, and non-disruptive upgrades. Uh, in terms of this cap theorem, you will get availability like software will be executing always. You will get partition tolerance. If there are like many nodes interacting and suddenly like they can't communicate with each other, they will continue to be serving whichever connections they have open. But you get only eventual consistency. So whatever happens in one partition of the net network will not be seen on the other, of course. And like when they reconnect, the language will guarantee that through message passing, they will synchronize well. This is very exciting to me. I, we might not need it for 90% of our projects, but it's super powerful. And if we don't need to invest productivity or like learning a whole new architecture to get all these benefits, why shouldn't we choose it? Um, so I wish we get a project where we actually need this. I've been coding and running nodes in my computer and splitting the network in my computer, and it worked well. Uh, but like, I wish that comes practically useful too to some clients. Uh, oh, the fact that software runs concurrently by default because of Elixir and Erlang uh, means that um, you can scale horizontally easily. You just add more nodes, and they will synchronize with each other automatically. You don't need to think about it. Whereas in, in Ruby processes and Rails, you need to scale vertically first, or put a proxy in front of them, and then be routing requests. But then sharing state gets hard between the different nodes, and then you have Redis, and then Redis is a single point of failure, and then everything can fail again. So it's just robust. So these are the features that Erlang provides. Distributed fault tolerance, soft real time, which is like uh, waiting for a second for a call to connect is OK, but not much more. Uh, high availability, hot code swapping, and share nothing concurrency. This was the first popular implementation of the actor concurrency model that I think Clojure implements too, which was a very popular two years ago or three, and continues to be, of course. And what does Elixir build on top of Erlang now? So, well, Elix Elixir. Uh, uh, also provides, of course, all, all the benefits from the Erlang virtual machine and the OTP integration. It's functional instead of object-oriented, so that's going to be different. If you happen to enjoy this uh, paradigm, you will enjoy writing Elixir code. There is no state. Functions are pure. Uh, there are no side effects. Nothing that happens on one side of your system will affect what happens here. Uh, and it's more explicit. Uh, here is an example I wanted to put, like, a friend is writing Go now. He moved from Rails to Go, and he's like, I can't believe I have to write all the time all this boilerplate. And then in Rails, you get like the act as concurrent, and everything is OK, you think. But you have no idea what's going on. So that's when I say that it's a perfect balance. But that's not a fact. That's my opinion. <laughs> then the pipe operator is something interesting that it's not so easy to do in Ruby. We got a talk in Goruko, which I didn't attend, but I, but I know, <laughs> about how to implement it in Ruby. And it's a bit awkward. The reason is that each object for this kind of chaining to work needs to implement all the methods that we are applying. So in this case, it works because a split will return an enumerable, and map and reject will return enumerables as well. So it works nicely. But what if you want to give names to those steps? Then you would need to define these names in the enumerable module or in array. And that would be monkey patching. Or you would need to wrap all your objects in this like one container that Fabio Akita presented in Goruko and then unwrap them again, which is a similar idea with our wrapped gem. Um, so if we think about this problem in Elixir, you will like, get a functional version which looks like this. First, you pass in the argument, then you multiply by three, then you filter the odd ones, and then you sum everything up. And to make it more clear, you would put in 
explaining explanatory variables. Uh, then the pipeline operator means that you can write it this way, which is whatever was computed before, pass it in as the first argument for the next line of execution. And now you can give names to them naturally. And those will be functions that receive one argument, which is whatever you're passing in. And so it's very easy to extract like uh, intention revealing functions. This is a nice little feature we get. Then there are no assignments in Elixir. This is very fun. This is interesting. Like you can call without thinking about this, but equals means matching. So this works. 42 matches with 42, so this match will not fail. A and B will be matched, assigned to hello and the world. And this means that you can do pattern matching for the, the interesting implementations of common functions. For example, we were working with Brenda on this code. We wanted to put the active class on the document in an iteration if the document was selected. The implementation, you might imagine, will be like, does the assigned in the view contain this document? And if it does, then return the active string. Otherwise, return an empty string. The way of implement implementing that in Elixir looks like this. If the assigned in the view matches a hash that contains a document with an ID, which is the same as the ID passed in the second argument, and, and this is all like executed by Elix Elixir, the, there is no logic here, then return active. The ID at the right is the same as the ID in this nested structure. That's what's happening with pattern matching. For any other arguments, return empty string. No conditionals, no control mm -hmm. flows, no case statements. Just define the function again with a specific attribute set. And that will work. Uh, so Elixir and Ruby and Rails and Phoenix, I think they're interchangeable for most of our clients. Both are productive, both are good. If you are comfortable with one, choose that one, and it's going to be all right for everyone, unless there's a particular library, which I yet have to find, which is much better sold in Ruby and not yet in Phoenix, which might be the case. Um, but for some applications, we will need to use Elixir. And these are like very high traffic systems. Elixir is, is one order of magnitude faster. Just by default, it will run one order of magnitude faster. Instead of hundreds of milliseconds per response or caching or whatever, uh, you will be getting the microsecond response times or 10 milliseconds or whatever. You will never get n plus ones because Elixir will, uh, Phoenix will force you into preloading your associations or it will fail. So you will be able to write faster software from, from scratch. Then, oh, because El uh, Erlang runs one thread per core in your computer, that means that Elixir will be using all your cores in your computer. It's just running, you got eight cores, well, great. Your, your code will be running in the eight cores that you have. You don't even have to think about that. Then for distributed systems, the same thing. You can scale horizontally easily. High availability, you can do whole code swapping. You can, do, uh, you can implement your own rules of fault tolerance. What does it mean when a process goes down? Uh, so some type of clients with this kind of needs will prefer, we will prefer, to serve them with this technology. And very large applications might benefit also from the fact that the way you think about building applications in, in Elixir and Erlang is, by, is, naturally, um, is naturally split. And they call this umbrella projects, and I don't know how to describe it better yet, so I will implement it first and then talk more about that part. And these are the links I consulted, and now open to questions if I know how to answer. That's it. <laughs>